Hello, coffee culture family. Uh, today, I have a very special guest and a friend uh, named Jeff Gordonier. And I'm going to read, wave hello. <laughs> I'm going to read his little bio and then <laughs> let him say hello. So during the past decade, Jeff Gordonier has covered the world of food. As a reporter for the New York Times from 2011 to 2016, and as the food and drinks editor of Esquire magazine from two, 2016 to 2021. Over the years, he has also covered movies, music, poetry, and politics, and has contributed to publications such as Entertainment Weekly, Fortune, Outside, L, Fast Company, Details, Travel and Leisure, Departures, Breathe, Real Simple, Air Mail, the Los Angeles Times, and the website of the Poetry Foundation. Jeff is the author, most recently, of the 2019 book, Hungry, Eating, Road Tripping, and Risking It All with the Greatest Chef in the World, a portrait of Chef Rene Redzepi of Noma in Copenhagen. He has appeared in the Zhang Quan episode of the Netflix series Chef's Table, an episode that won a James Beard Foundation Award in 2018, and in Phil Rosenthal's Netflix series Somebody Feed Phil. Jeff has taught food writing at Drexel University in Philadelphia, has curated culinary and literary events for the Kotzbahn Cultural Center in New York's Hudson Valley, has published with co-editor Mark Weingarten, a collection of essays about women in music from 2015's Here She Comes Now, and is currently developing projects for television. He lives close to the Hudson River with his wife, Lauren Fonda, and his four children. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks. You didn't have to read the whole thing. I feel sort of guilty that people were subjected to that. <laughs> no, you know, it's funny. Very often I, I try to write or um, take off from somebody's bio, but yours is so robust and it's so special. And I just couldn't quite wing that one. And I didn't want oh. to leave anything out of importance. So I decided oh, nice. to read it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the Hudson River is right there. I'm looking at it. I feel nice. like I've looked at the river in all its different moods for three years now because of, you know, this time, 2020, the pandemic was really kicking in to its uh, to the lockdown phase and everything. So I just sat here day after day and looked at the river. Um, and so, you've, you've posted pictures yeah. of that on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, you with, noticed that. Yeah, yes, that's my, I don't know why I do that. Yeah, it's, it, it's literally just what I see out my window um, and with a song that comes to mind. I noticed recently that the, the author Michael Chabin, um, you know, author of Wonder Boys and Mysteries of Pittsburgh and books like that, he does it much better than I do. He has this whole graphic um, and it says sort of something like, um, brainwave radio he has all, he has all, he's branded it you know and um, I should have thought of that it's too late now but I, I it really is just the song that comes to mind um, sometimes there's some meaning to it because of the seasons or something occurring in the news but mo most of the time it's it's utterly random um, yeah my life is, is wildly domestic really um <laughs> I mean, I used to travel constantly. I used to travel when the pandemic hit. I think I realized that for 30 years, I had traveled every single month for 30 years as a journalist somewhere. Now, so it could have been Siberia, Patagonia, Korea, Italy, Switzerland, Denmark, Mexico, or it could have been Baltimore, you know, or Memphis, or, uh, you know, across the river in New Jersey. But I, will, I was always traveling somewhere to report things and always experiencing a place that I'd never visited before, which continues to nourish the neurons and the, you know, activate the synapses, whatever. And, uh, and um, the last three years have been um, a remarkable contrast, I must say. Like my, what's mostly on my mind this morning is that just before this began, I clicked start on my rice cooker I put some beautiful rice in there, some Japanese style rice that uh, a family in the Hudson 
Hudson Valley Grows. And I put a Japanese sweet potato in the oven to roast while we talk. And so when we're done, I will stir fry some tofu and vegetables and make a little like vegetable rice bowl with the rice and sweet potatoes and the vegetables. And I'm just really excited about that lunch. <laughs> and that's like mostly my life these days is like dealing with the twins uh, who are about to turn five in May and um, thinking about lunch and thinking about my reading list. I have a, a really boring life in many ways. So sorry to your listeners. <laughs> no, I disagree. So, so let's track back just a tiny bit there. So you love to cook. With... Well, I love to cook, but I must say that I'm not like, um, I'm not skilled at it in the way that chefs are. I mean, I don't really follow recipes and, um, I have, a an arsenal, so to speak of about eight to 10 dishes that I make over and over and over and, and, and a, the, you know, little variations transpire, but my, my, my teen son, Toby will tell you that he, he becomes somewhat sick of the, the, the dad uh, regiment of, of dinners. Like it's basically there's, there's too a, predictable. It, yeah. I mean, like I make chicken thighs constantly and all different, Me too. Mer- you know, like in a Le Creuset, like, a, you know, and I, I like to, to brown them and then just sort of slow cook them with last night. I just, I used a kind of harissa and olive oil and, and a whole onion. And that was it. Like I didn't put a whole bunch of vegetables in. I just put the chicken thighs, you know, with the harissa coating on them, brown them, some olive oil, the onion. And I got to say it was the best. I'm learning how to simplify. I think in the past I've, my, my inclination has just been like throw everything into the pot and it just becomes muddled, right, with flavor. Mm-hmm. And and you learn that the best cooking, like people say, like people have said for centuries, the best cooking is simple. And it's, you know, learning how to focus on one thing or two things as opposed to 12 things. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, less ingredients, higher quality, so you can yeah. really identify the flavors. It's It's funny because I've listened to you in other podcasts <laughs> and I've read your writing and uh-huh. I I know a little bit about you just from that. I mean, aside from the fact that we've followed each other since we've met, um, but I think what is so charming is that you're in a constant state of creativity. And mm. I really enjoy like that download about food and music and things like that. And oh. I I have already fashioned a book for you oh. of, your, <laughs> of your eight family friendly recipes and variations <laughs> that could be made with them but more importantly the music playlist while prepping and the music playlist while eating and then i'd like to see those playlists on spotify so i could access them while i make the recipe so this is where my brain goes <laughs> you know i i that's so, that's really kind of you i think that i i'm sure a lot of people are like this i mean i i just think of myself as sort of a perpetual student you know, like mm-hmm. I'm in a constant state of teaching my stu- myself things that I did not know. And it seems like a lot of people I know, um, they seem to know everything. They're just all aware of every artistic movement, cinematic movement, musical mm-hmm. movement, culinary movement. And I'm catching up, I guess. I grew up in a very conservative uh, environment um, in all uh, meanings of the word conservative. And, um, you know, like last night I watched... Um, all the beauty and the bloodshed, which is a documentary about Nan Golden, the artist, and her um, activist campaign against the Sackler family, um, who created, uh, who sort of fostered, in, in part, the opioid addiction uh, problem. And and I, uh, the night before or two nights before, I watched Navalny, this documentary about you know the leader of the opposition movement in in Russia. And his being poisoned and going back to Russia after that. And I mean, every time I watch something like this, I'm like, wow, I have a lot to learn. <laughs> like, I need to know more. I see I'm I, I'm sort of voracious uh, in, in terms of consuming culture. And I think I annoy a lot of my friends with this because I'm constantly texting them. It's like, oh, my, oh my God. God. Constantly. Same. Like, have you... Have you seen all the beauty and the bloodshed? It completely changed my life. I mean, I stayed up late last night to watch it, to finish watching it because I knew the the twins would get up 
early and I'd regret having less sleep, but I just could I couldn't cut it off halfway. It was so powerful. And um you know, like I have this with a cluster of about six friends. I have uh something called the Boxing Day Book Club, which is um we vowed starting on Boxing Day of last year, which is the day after Christmas, <laughs> vowed to read forty books by Boxing Day 2023. So I'm on book 10 right now, um, which is okay. I mean, I'm like, so that's 10 within, you know, in the winter. Each season is basically 10, 10 winter, 10 spring, 10 summer. Um, and, um, you know, I'm just a geek. I'm like, a, just, I don't know. It's kind of embarrassing. I'm very earnest about these things, like catching up with the Oscar nominated movies, reading all these books I find essential i mean partly like the last book i read was how the word is passed by clint smith it's an absolutely essential book about um slavery and um confederate monuments and the way in which um the most troubling odious currents of our american history are often suppressed or sugar-coated and and um it's a book where in which he visits former plantations and he visits angola prison and he visits um a confederate sort of memorial gathering and he thinks about the way we um process history as americans it's a huge best-selling book it won a lot of prizes and i was just embarrassed that i hadn't read it yet you know like i i i just sometimes i at one point last year I looked around my room here and I was like, oh, there's Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. <laughs> I've had that there for years. I have never actually read it. There's The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, won the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize, and I have never read it. And it's cool that I bought it, but it's kind of embarrassing and shameful that I haven't read it. So I just decided to remedy that. <laughs> and I'm really glad I did. I well, mean, it's creating just, that book club probably yeah. like put the uh, the onus on you to like get it done and to really not just buy it, but read it. Right. Yeah. Well, I started last last uh, fall. I realized it started, I think, with a conversation with Brian Koppelman. Sorry to be name dropping here, but he's one of the, the co-creators of Billions on TV. And he's a wonderful guy. He loves food. He's a really nice person. And he had mentioned it. He said, at one point said something to me like, what's your favorite Murakami novel? And I was like, um, you know, the one that's, and he's like, no, you, you've you never read a, a Murakami novel? And I'm like, I, I haven't, I haven't. Me I, neither. I'm, I'm totally embarrassed. Like, I mean, you know, this incredibly prominent author from Japan that I've never I, it's just it's shameful and I'm a writer you know and so I read I decided to read Norwegian Wood which is really famous and like sold millions and millions of copies I mean it's a very obvious place to start but I thought screw it I mean if it's that popular I want to know what it is right and and so I determined last fall to read 10 novels um, just fiction just both basically like contemporary fiction or recent-ish fiction mm -hmm. Um a book called The Incendiaries by R.O. Kwan, a book by uh, Rachel Kong called uh, Goodbye Vitamin, um, The Joke by Milan Kundera. I just like decided to kind of catch up with it and, and it felt really good. And when I finally got to the end, the last three were my favorite books of the whole thing. Um, Station Eleven, you know, it's like post-apocalyptic novel by Emily St. John Mandel. <laughs> that I think is a TV series too now. And then um, the underground railroad by Colson Whitehead and then love in the time of cholera. And it was like running a marathon. Like, you know, people, I'm never going to run a marathon, but the people, people who do, you know, they finished a marathon or a triathlon or something. There's so much satisfaction that they accomplished that. I kind of felt like that. It was like, I'm so proud of myself that with four children and all these deadlines and all these domestic demands and, like everyone, so many demands and all that I put the freaking phone down and read books instead. It was um, kind of like creating a Sabbath in my life, you know, like a space away from technology. 
So I'm sorry if this is boring to your re your listeners, but I I, I really I, I advocate for this. And it's partly why I said to a group of my friends, um, you know, guys, let's try to do this, um, because because we all have to, I think, force ourselves to get away from the vortex of the news cycle and technology. You know, I mean, I think it's important to read the news, of course, but it's like you can't just read the news all day. You'll, it's just it just erodes your mental health, frankly. The, Absolutely. You know. Well, I think, <laughs> I think also, you know, our phones listen to us and we are fed what they think we want to yeah. hear, see, read, yeah. do. And, um, uh, you know, I, I grew up as you. I'm Gen X. So I, yeah. you know, actually you know, would sit around listening to an album side one from yeah. beginning to end and then flip it over and reading an actual book because there was no such thing as, you know, Kindles or audio books or any of that. And um, I have, I too have gone through that exercise, not as oh. uh, beautifully or as extensively in the list, but I have pushed myself to yeah. sit down and read books from cover to cover again. Mm -hmm. um, one of my little joys, and of course, I'm not necessarily finding, you know, the classics like you are. And, and we definitely need your book list, by the way, to put in the oh, show notes. Okay. But um, I have all of these little libraries around DC that people built on their, their property. And they're just little boxes where you leave a book and take a book type oh, yeah. of thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I love the serendipity of that. Um, yeah. it, it's completely unplanned. It's completely spontaneous. I'm walking the dog and I open up the little box and I look through there and I come home with a book or two. And then when I'm done, I put it in a different box. Um, or if I buy a book or whatever, I pop them in there. And mm -hmm. um, I've been enjoying that. I'm finding some very um, interesting little books that way. But I do yeah. realize that um, I have failed to, to read a lot of the classics and I always say I'm going to do it. And I too had um, some books on my shelf that, you know, looked cool because in the moment everybody was talking about it, but I yeah. never read it. Yeah. So, um, and, on, and when I moved down to DC, a lot of stuff got packed away. So I actually will have to rebuy some stuff, but yeah. um, I do like an actual book. Um, I, I just received a galley for an interview that I have next week and I have to oh. read it on my iPad oh, and, yeah. um, and I'm not enjoying that part yeah. at all. And I'm used to making notes in the margins, which I can't do on this book because it was fed to me in a different, uh, modality. Like it just doesn't allow you to make notes on it. It's, it's mm. a galley that's kind of protected. So I have to jump through a few hoops to get that right. Like, so when I uh, you know, with my notes. So I've, I've been writing them, you know, cause I do like pen and paper. Yeah. And so I've been writing my notes while reading it. And then yesterday I recorded all of my comments and the quotes in garage band. Cause I'm a podcaster. Uh -huh. And then this is, but this is the hoops I have to go through. Then I took that MP3 file and I uploaded it to Otter uh, dot AI to be transcribed. And then I went in and I edited all of my notes and then I will print it so that the day of the interview, I actually have some hard copy things I could write on and read properly because that's how I process. Like yeah. I'm, um, your book, everybody, which I'll put in the show notes. This is my second time reading it, by the way. Um, cool. And I have like tons of little like handwritten notes, <laughs> things <laughs> underlined. Like that's the beauty. Like you feel like you're you're with the author. Like you're yeah. you're you're in that creative process with them. You're in their head mm. for a little while. Yeah. Um. I really yeah. I, I think that you know I I always read on paper. I just buy the books if I can. You know, and you know sometimes I feel like when people say oh, I, I read on my phone. Or whatever. I I think it's almost like as if someone had addiction issues and they and they're and they're but they're going to cook to kind of 
get away from you know, cooking as a form of therapy. And she said, great, come on in and let's cook. Here's the sugar. Here's the salt. And this is cocaine. This powder is good. But don't touch that, you know. I mean, that's what happens when you're on your phone. You're like, okay, yeah. there's this, uh, there's a bunch of texts, you know, you get pulled in. You so, do. I mean, the text, how the technology is engineered to create addicts out of us. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of coming to accept my old fashionedness about a lot of this stuff. I also send postcards, you know, which is like weird, but like I have a bunch of them here. They're, um, from all over i buy them everywhere i go and i buy them at museums and stuff and they're pre-stamped a lot of times i stamp them in advance mm. um, and um, i send them to uh, I have international stamps as well so i send some to my daughter and she's in greece right now she was in paris for last semester and i just like randomly send here's the international stamps um send her a postcard and say hi um or i send it to my friend jason in richmond or um actually pete wells from the times has received some of my postcards there's a bunch of friends i i just do these random things which are really probably um pathological ticks on my part i'm, I'm not sure they're justifiable I'm, I'm, they're just forms of neurosis no um, you know what they are they are your connection it's how you share your um the creative that you are uh it's how you share your love it's how you connect with people you give it's kind of like even just sending a text about a book that you just finished reading to your friend or yeah. Um, sending the postcard and and putting your beautiful prose in there it's it's part uh, of the your prose in the postcards is mostly just it's just completely arbitrary and i mean it's it, it it's i don't know that it's and sometimes it's a way to cure writer's block though I, i'll say like when I'm, I'm on deadline and i don't know how to get started i'll, I'll sometimes just dash off a couple of postcards That's and a randomly cool idea. send them yeah just to kind of like almost literally get the, the muscles moving um but um, I don't know. It's funny. It probably, but I mean, it's probably neurotic in the sense that I seem to prefer to communicate with friends through texts and postcards and and songs than in person. <laughs> like in person, I kind of fold up and clench, and I seem increasingly anxious. But um, so you're you know. an, you're kind of like when you when you sit down with friends. Is is your more no, I mean, it's introverted side I, 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 I seem to be resisting more and more going out. And I don't know. I'm just going through a weird phase. I'm also well, like just I'm, I'm sort of like taking a sabbatical from even going to restaurants for a couple months because of um, some health stuff I want to get to the bottom of. So um, which uh, you see right here, I have these patches on my face. I have this skin okay. issue. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah, I have like flare-ups and so i'm working with this nutritionist who's trying to get me to change my diet and look at what might be causing it mm. i actually stopped drinking three years ago too um i have a martini once every six months or so i mean it's not like an aa thing i'm happy to have a drink but um you know like a lot of people during the, or those early months of the pandemic i found that Drinking at home day after day while being trapped in the house was just not a good vibe. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, yeah. You know, no, it, it was no, like no. affecting my sleep, my skin, my moods, and the twins were waking up at five in the morning. Just didn't, I did not accommodate hangovers. So I just stopped. And then, as a lot of people say, these when they go through a sober, curious phase, that just feels good. Mm -hmm. it feels mm -hmm. good, you know? Like and you I think. I think a lot of people and, and restaurants are now really embracing that sober curious yeah. concept and they're creating mocktails that are actually interesting, not like, yeah. you know, it, back in the day, if you didn't want an alcoholic beverage, you would just get like some club soda with a lime yeah. in it. Like there was no thought, maybe a splash of cranberry juice. Like there wasn't any thought process, but now it's almost becoming a bit of an art form. 
Yeah, um, it to totally is. I mean, actually, I went to a restaurant in Harlem called Reverence um, month or so. I don't know, a few weeks back, and the chef Russell Jackson uh, doesn't drink himself, and and he has a whole non-alcoholic pairing for every single course in this tasting menu. I mean, and then now there's non-alcoholic wines, non-alcoholic gins, non-alcoholic bourbons. I mean, it's crazy. Beers. I have some non-alcoholic beer in the fridge called um, Al's. So it's quite good. Hmm. But I, I will say to you that, I mean, candidly, I don't, I, I, I don't, I'm not drawn to a non-alcoholic gin in the same way that I'm not drawn to a non-alcohol. I'm not drawn to a fake meat, right? Like when mm -hmm. when something is like chicken, but it's made like you know, or like Beyond Meat, Impossible Burger type stuff. I mean, no, no judgment per se. That's just not my jam. Like I, I I'd rather have what I'm gonna have for lunch, which is like a big bowl of tofu and vegetables, Japanese sweet way. potato rice, just like real food. I don't need a fake spin on a hot dog or something like it doesn't I, yeah, it's I kind fact, of like gross in a way sometimes. yeah well it just defeats the purpose to me like I just I'd rather you know just celebrate the good fortune of the seasons and what we're given in any particular season and it's the same way I feel about these like like you know Noma the restaurant I wrote about in um Hungry in Copenhagen. I mean, they have a non-alcoholic pairing that's just absolutely sublime. And it involves teas, herbal infusions, fruit juices, kombuchas, all sorts of fascinating fermented beverages that are not alcoholic. It's just and, and it, the pairing works with each dish. Um, you see a lot of that, too. Um, there's also in 2020, actually, for Esquire during our best new restaurants list, we often name you know, like beverage director of the year, chef of the year, rising star of the year. And our beverage of the year that we chose in 2020 was Gia, spelled G-H-I-A. That's a non-alcoholic cocktail beverage. And it's, it's probably the first time Esquire ever chose a non-alcoholic thing. It's the drink of the year. Um, right. It's just so delicious. It's just, and not sweet, um, has a lovely kind of bitterness at the back of it. I mean, I, I like that. And um yeah, I, so I mean, I, it, I like it, creations too that aren't um, trying to taste like something else, like yeah. trying to taste like a burger or trying to taste yeah. like gin. Like I, like you, would rather have some unique shrub or kombucha or some some iteration of yeah. a food or a drink that is its own thing and not. It, it's funny. I'm just going to jump back for a second. We met in Park City, Utah yeah. at the bar at yeah. the Lodge at Blue Sky. And yeah. um, the woman sitting next to us was actually Impossible Burger. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, I don't remember that. You have a good memory. Yeah, wow. <laughs> no, I don't have the best memory. But I, as soon as you said Impossible Burger, all of a sudden it went click, click, click. Um, I've had and, them and it's fine. I mean, but to me, yeah. like, I mean, I, I, I'm, an, I'm an omnivore. Like I'd rather just eat a burger now and then. I mean, to, you know, yeah. they, they, uh, I, I'll tell you, over, uh, you know, I have over the years become friendly with a lot of vegan kind of uh, activist, prominent, eminent vegan, shall we say, like Rich Roll, who's a podcaster. And um, I'm friends with Dan Buettner, who wrote the Blue Zones books. Uh, the blue zones are places around the world where people live to 100 or beyond, you know, like uh, Sardinia and Icaria and Crete and um, the Nicoya Peninsula and Costa Rica, Okinawa and Japan, and actually Loma Linda, California. Um, and so these, you know, there's all different factors as to why people live longer these places where people forget to die as they've said about Dan's books and reporting. Um, a lot of it is they, they eat a mostly plant-based diet. Like they eat mostly kind of, you know, rice, beans, breads, grains, fruits, fresh fruit. Um, you know, they'll eat meat now and then or, or dairy products, but it's in a much more limited way. It's like, like sometimes it's a, it's a salt pork is just the flavoring of a vegetable stew or something like that. Um, so it's not like Dan Butner in his research has found people that people are purists about it. They're not like absolutists. Um, I'm not a puritanical person by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I, I, I think it just basically makes sense to reduce how much meat you eat, right? Mm -hmm, to eat mm -hmm. it 
um, now and then and take pleasure from it and, and but just like not overdo it. So, I mean, I, I think at some point Mark Bittman had that like vegan before six slogan and I think that stuck with me and I seem to do that. Like I tend to have a vegan breakfast and lunch and mm -hmm, then dinner, mm -hmm. dinner, all bets are off. <laughs> and, and yeah, and and I would probably say like um, a lot of the um, vegan recreated foods to resemble something of the past uh, that was a meat or a cheese or whatever. Sometimes the list of ingredients yeah. is frightening because it it is so extensively long yeah. that. Um, at, at that point, I don't even really want to ingest it because it's a little <laughs> scary. I know. I, I just rather have an, an apple at that point and call it a day, you know, like seriously. Just, yeah. It's a little scary. Some of the ingredients. Totally. Sure. And and it's like, it's like, oh, so like you want protein, like here's a tip hummus. Hummus mm -hmm. is vegan. Just mm -hmm. have hummus. Like, right. Olive oils in it, tahini. Like these are all good quality ingredients. With yeah. I mean, fats. guacamole, guacamole is, is Love. vegan. Like there's like, uh, yeah. I Love mean, it. you can have a, a rice, rice and beans and some roasted squash, some guacamole and some hummus and you're good to go. I mean, that's a delicious meal. And I you know, agree. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like so many cultures, particularly in the Middle East, particularly around the Mediterranean. Um, Southern Italy, Turkey. I mean, there's so many vegan uh, preparations that are, nobody's sitting around <laughs> for millennia and nobody said, oh, yeah, I'm vegan. It's just the way people utilize what's in season and what's local. Um, and so it doesn't always take that much um, manipulation to, mm -hmm. to have a, a beautiful vegan or vegetarian meal. The other thing is like I'm just – you know, I think the the lunch I'm going to have today is going to be vegan, except that I did put some, I probably will cook something in ghee, you know, the clarified butter that, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, from everything I read, it helps to be sort of a conduit for nutrients. Like sometimes you need these sort of bridges of, so that the nutrients actually get absorbed into your system. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's these good fats. So, um, you know, anyway. Um, well, you're, you're like me. I, it sounds like a fly by the seat of your pants chef. Um, yeah. and I like, I always say like, I would, I should be on like one of those chef, like iron chef mom or something where, like, <laughs> you open the fridge and there's like three ingredients in there and yeah. I will make something really good. Even if it's a salad or a soup, like just, I'm really good at that. Like I, awesome. I don't need to follow recipes, but intuitively I think, my body asks for certain things, you know, oh. and, and I'm not vegan. So, um, that doesn't mean I wouldn't eat a vegan meal, but it's yeah. just not how I eat. Yeah. Um, and I like playing with different things. Like you were saying, just even adding a little bit of ghee or yeah. whatever you add to it. Um, I'm, I'm a big advocate of cooking like that. Like when you described your meal, like that's kind of how I am here. Uh, it's again, it's the creative in us. Like we're just, we're always thinking about, you know, what's happening. Like, look at the river outside and what song goes with <laughs> that. And here's <laughs> lunch and, oh, wait, I found this in the back of the fridge. Let me add it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. You know, you know, the, the, the dumb part of, of this for me is like, I'm, I'm posting the river pictures of the river on Instagram with a song and I'm sending people postcards and I'm doing my reading list. None of this uh, generates any revenue <laughs> <laughs> i'm not good at monetizing these things i you know i also have a poetry practice that i've done for 14 15 years um <clears throat> which is i i have a stack of books that i'm reading right now of poetry books that's outside of my fiction and non-fiction list i'm clearly i don't know I'm, i need to examine this but um i i i flip through a book of poetry at random if if if, if a if a, po a poem really leaps out at me um and i mean it has to have almost like a physical and almost physically has to grab me um then i open the book and i hold it open with this stapler and i type up the poem into my gmail so recently it's poems by somebody named jenny george i know very little about jenny george i, I know absolutely nothing really i think she lives in new mexico but um she had a poem in poetry magazine 
about washing someone's hair over a tin bucket. And it was just beautiful, very short. Not mm -hmm. not a haiku, but almost that short. And it just moved me. And so I bought a, bo a book of her work. I don't remember the name. And um, so lately I've typed up some of her poems. Uh, just exactly as they are. I mean, it just, you know, copy the spacing and the punctuation. And then um, I do that sort of to see how the uh, <clears throat> the music of the poem operates, sort of how the mechanics of the poem work. And um, then I, I share it with 60 friends. Wow. Can I be added but to it, that list? <laughs> people ask a lot, but it, it, it's sort of a be careful what you wish for thing because it, it, it's it's not a it's not an email blast with like everyone BCC and it's individual. Mm. Okay, so Jason, Ian, Rosie, Pete, Tom, Allison, Ben. Trying to think of all the different people. Mm -hmm. David. Um. Yeah, it's uh, Gabrielle. There's a bunch of chefs. Massimo Batura actually has gotten these poems for many years now. Gabrielle Hamilton. Um. It's beautiful. I'm sure they yeah, appreciate I, it too. Dominique Crenn. Actually, mm -hmm. Dominique Crenn has posted some of them on Instagram. Um, it's just um, I get it's like for me. I think it's my religious upbringing. Like I I have moved away from the church over the years, but I think there's a need I have for like prayer mm -hmm. or some sort of sa sacrament, like some sort of almost expression of gratitude for life. So, um, it used to be every day. Literally every day, including weekends, I would do a poem. But I, you know, with the little kids and um, it's hard. That lines are, yeah. Now it's maybe once a week if I'm lucky. Maybe once a month. It's gotten much more sparse. Um, I became really interested in a poet named John Katy. Um, it's spelled his last name is spelled K O E T K O E T H E. I believe lives in Wisconsin and and somebody in the Times um, a poetry columnist in the New York Times wrote about his work and so I sought it out um, I mean I'm that guy I'm, I mean, I don't know that there's many people like this I, I would literally read a review of a poetry book and if it appeals to me I buy the book mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully from an indie bookstore and then I kind of become consumed with it um, yeah but that's where that's the essence of you i mean you were the person who wrote the reviews and then people would go out of their way to go to that restaurant and experience yeah. what you experienced i mean it you, you're doing exactly how you operate as a writer like that makes perfect yeah. sense to me but we yeah. have to figure out how to monetize some of these things <laughs> yeah. for you so i, you, I review I'm, poetry for the times actually i i do i but i mean it, it, it it's only like two or three reviews a year and you know so it's and the pay is not you know voluminous as you might imagine but um i just yeah i i don't know that the restaurants thing is really interesting to me because people are always asking me I'll tell you, like the other day, um, the other day, Holly, somebody on Facebook, I won't say who, but somebody on Facebook posted like, oh, I'm going to be in Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, San Diego area. Do you have restaurant recommendations? Well, mm -hmm. let me tell you, I got a fuckload of restaurant recommendations in those places. I'm from the, I'm, my parents live in Laguna Beach. I grew up in the Pasadena area and Laguna Beach, and I'm back there every single summer and often other times of the year, my wife's family is from Los Angeles and I worked in Santa Barbara for years. I mean, I know the area really well and the Esquire best new restaurants list I contribute to every year. I tend to cover that part of the country. So that's, I, that was a loaded question he asked. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> don't get me started. So, you know, and um, you know, um, this individual seemed very receptive and, and uh, you know, so I, I, I recommended, Young Bond Society in downtown Los Angeles, which at Esquire was our number two restaurant in the 2022 list. And Katiana and John Hong were the chefs, a married couple, were our chefs of the year. So I was like, Young Bond Society in, Sa in Santa Barbara, you got to go to La Super Rica, this famous taqueria for lunch. You have to. You have to. David Crosby, may he rest in peace, used to be in line there all the time, Jackson Brown, but I mean, everybody just waits in line, gets these amazing handmade tortillas. Um, San Diego, where to begin? You know, I loved Cali, Travis Schweikart's restaurant there. I mean, you know, 
<clears throat> recommended a sushi place in the in the San Fernando Valley. But I noticed <laughs> on this Facebook thread that people were like kind of resist. Other people were like resistant. They're like, "Who's this? You know, guy kind of bigfooting around. This guy comes in stomping around with his blue check, saying, "Go here, go here." And most where most people recommend is just the place they've been going forever. That's it. I mean, they were recommending quite honestly the most cliched tourist trap places like in santa barbara that's like you should not go to those places they're just same run here. they're just like i this is my job if you ask i will tell you because i'm a generous soul i will tell you where to go but like i i, I and so, this sounds nasty but i do kind of i mean it's funny but i do kind of mean it like i don't mind if you ask me for restaurant recommendations what i mind is if you don't listen <laughs> All right. So you, I asked you when I'm totally I came serious. to DC. No, I know because yeah. you came because to it, DC and um, and I'm well, going we to DC. Each other. Yeah, I'm going to DC again with my son on a college tour in a few days, and and you know I already have. I'm going to a Peruvian restaurant. I mean, mapped out. You know, like uh, my friend Sura? Sona. Are you going to Sura? Is that what? No, it's called Peruvian? Amazonia. Oh, okay. It's a right. place called Calsa de Amazonia. Calsa is like a tasting menu, and Amazonia is upstairs and is like. Um, but you, you you gave me recommendations back in um 2020 because we had yeah. missed each other it was like yeah. a pandemic whoosh, yeah. passing through the night kind of thing <clears throat> and um i want you to know that it still lives on my phone i had a special <laughs> notes area for recommendations with your name on it i've shared it with other people i've gone to those places oh I've cool been, I, I, it, it was really meaningful that you took the time to do that for me and um, I'm still using it. I just want you to know. Cool. And I mean, you know, like, listen, not everyone is going to like everyone, but it's like, it's, it's, it is my, it, I do put a lot of legwork into this, right? Like, I mean, it probably had Aldi and it probably had Green Almond Pantry, Seven yep. Reasons, yep. Centralina and Picolina. Went to all of them. Yep. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Amy Brandwine is a chef in D.C., and she's got these two restaurants on that little alley, almost like a shopping center alley, Centralina on one side, Picolina on the other. And I just yep, think her too. cooking is so special. Yep. I've and she really both. deserves more attention, you know? They redid um, Picolina, by the way. Yeah, I heard that. The space. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, it just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when people have a mediocre meal and they didn't have to. And they're in one mm -hmm. of the world's, they're in one of the country's great food cities like Philadelphia or Portland, Oregon, and they, they settle for some tourist trap because some magazine. High, no, no. Or like, cause some high school friend on Facebook told them to go there. Like, don't like, I don't know. I mean, but we have, we have here, <laughs> like, as you know, in DC, there's a lot of great places, but a lot of the magazines, they market themselves to some of the places that have been all the time. Like they get rated top all the time and there's a couple on that list i'm going to say are kind of mediocre at best oh, it's just yeah. a place to see and be seen but the yeah. food is i'm not going to say any of the restaurants i'll say it when we're not recorded but okay <laughs> um i just I, I that bothers me a little bit because i think there's a lot of um really unique places to eat with um chefs that are really really honing in on their craft and doing special things and then i see on repeat the same restaurants you know the top 10 places to go yeah. on a on a date the top 10 restaurants for this year the top 10 for the best drinking atmosphere and on repeat it's like the same places and i'm like but they're just okay <laughs> they're not even that great yeah <laughs> It's, it, you know, there are some old, I mean, I'm not all just about new restaurants. I mean, lately, uh, the uh, my last couple of trips into Manhattan, I dropped into Hearth, Marco Canora's restaurant, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. I dropped into Veselka. It's a great Ukrainian diner in the East Village. It's been there since 1954, I believe. And these were both just beautiful, nourishing experiences. You know, um, there are some places that, stand the test of time and become almost the, the the heartbeat of a city you know they just mm -hmm. become like namwa tea parlor great new york noodle town um woo's wonton king um those places in chinatown to me are just like so essential to the city and just <laughs> such high quality like i mean like <clears throat> consistent 
consistent high quality at Wu's Wonton King. It's so good. And it's so, so like, scary when they close. A lot of them close oh, after the heartbreaking. pandemic, right? Heartbreaking. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, some some seem to come back, but it's um listen, I mean, life is life is brutal. Places close, places fade out. There used to be this place up in the Upper West Side when I lived in the Upper West Side in the 90s called La Caridad that was like, a, you know, um, Cuban Chinese kind of restaurant. Like it had it had um, sort of Latin classics from the Caribbean and it also had um, Chinese food, you know, and it was just so good. Sorry, my phone is ringing if that's coming through. I thought no, it had you're good. <laughs> no one from Albany I want to talk to. Um <laughs> never even been there um so uh that la caridad used to i mean when i moved to new york city in 1994 i was making so little money i was at entertainment weekly and i i think they originally offered me less money than i had made at the santa barbara news press a daily newspaper in santa barbara but i now was going to live in new york city it was like how am i going to live on this yeah, exactly. so i would go to la caridad and get rice and beans all the time and like if i could afford it a side of avocado you know literally just yellow rice black beans avocado some hot sauce and that was dinner all the time and mm. it was beautiful like i still have such a craving for that dinner <laughs> and uh sitting on a in my fire escape i mean i know it sounds like west side story or something but i would sit on my fire escape and have this out of a you know little aluminum container and um you know so when i heard la caridad closed I, it really broke my heart it was, mm -hmm. a, it was crushing it wasn't like some temple of gastronomy mm -hmm. you know it wasn't mm -hmm. like i don't even think you know compared to veselka i don't think it was necessarily the level of cooking but um it was just a meaningful soulful place and uh you know um same people working there for decades you know yeah, it's hard it's hard these places go they go away it happens you know so yeah and speaking of which it, what brought me back to you um everybody should know that i asked you to come on my show a couple years ago and you were so inundated when the pandemic hit because everybody oh. was, was asking you to you know come on their show and rate this and review that and whatever um and you were not in the frame of mind um but <laughs> i'm what, sorry no no don't apologize i th I, th I think people um you know they they're they ask, they over ask. It was totally fine. Like you, oh. you had four kids, you know, you were trapped at home and I totally got it. But the reason why I bring it up is I was on Instagram and I saw the New York Times article about Noma closing oh, yeah. in 2024, talking about restaurants closing. Maybe that's yeah. a, a poor segue, but hey, here I am. And um, it's, I'm I'm just first of all are you going to be there uh before they close in 2024 and um how how does that impact you like cuz you you know that was near and dear to your heart you road tripped with the guy for 4 years and um you know just like these restaurants you talk about that close like they're very special to you what what, what did that feel like when you learned about that Well I was not surprised cuz I've talked to Renee frequently for many years and I, I know how restless he is and I know that he was eager to change things up um I think part of what happened is that the pandemic hit and the <clears throat> grinder of work the, the sort of um you know I don't know what what you'd call it the just the grueling endless schedule of you know working in a restaurant finally ceased for him and he was able to think about his path think about daily life he started going on these long, long walks long hikes he's hiked in japan hiked in uh, spain and i i i, I spend more time with his family spend more time meditating spend more time trying to mull over mistakes he's made over the years i know that he's put a lot of effort into trying to change and um improve and uh i think that you know, there are reasons given why Noma is closing that it's like economic, that it has to do with that it's not sustainable financially. Honestly, 
I'm sure every, I'm sure there's part of it. I'm sure there's many factors here, but I think part of it is Renee just wants to move on. Mm -hmm. You know, he's made his mark. He's created a whole movement. He sort of changed the face of Copenhagen um, mm -hmm. and its culinary scene. And I think he wants to shake it up. I have never met a more restless person in my life. I mean, he's, I, there's a scene in Hungary where they finally get to the sort of peak of Noma, Mexico. They've, most of the book is about him trying to create this pop-up in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it, it struck, struck me as something you'd see in a Werner Herzog movie, like, you know, trying to make this thing happen in this impossible location or seemingly, seemingly impossible. Many, many, many challenges over and over. Funding, he was like a magician. Out. He was like yeah, a magician I mean, it's, just, like he, it's, it's force of will to try to get it to come about. And, and, and we get to the point where Thomas Keller is coming that night to eat. The menu is clicked into place. Everything's happening. And Renee seemed incredibly grumpy when I talked to him. He did not seem high. He did not seem elated. He just was like, can we move on? And um, so I end that with like, a, I don't actually even show the meal. I end that like a, a 1970s film, like at the end of The Candidate with Robert Redford, where he's just sitting on the bed saying like he's won the election he's like what do we do now i mm. i felt like just to stop like the process is much more interesting to renee than the product if that makes any sense the actual <laughs> meal the the actual pop-up um having been achieved was sort of of no interest to him anymore he wanted to move on he was already thinking about the next menu in copenhagen um future products future projects i um, he's not someone who rests on his laurels. So, um, so to answer your question, I mean, the closing of Noma didn't, didn't surprise me at all. I could not see him running the same restaurant for, you know, into his eighties. I don't, I don't think he's wired that way. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of restaurants, if you go to, um, you know, name, name a famous, like Zuni Cafe. Right mm -hmm. in San Francisco, like a lot of people will go to Zuni Cafe, and they'll get the the same salad, the same roast chicken. There, there, there are classics of Zuni Cafe that are so beloved that it's unusual for customers to veer from those dishes, those signature dishes. Barbudo in New York City, Jonathan Waxman has moved Barbudo, but the menu is you know he still has his famous roast roast chicken with salsa verde. Everybody gets it famous kale salad that's like they massage the kale forever the the, the, the kitchen team must have incredibly strong fingers um, <laughs> there's not a fiber to be found in them <laughs> yeah they're just like noma is not that they have no signature dishes they change the menu every few months based on the seasons and i don't mean they like alter the menu completely change the menu. no dish ever repeats ever there's no dish that ever comes back there are mm -hmm. dishes from 2015 2017 2019 that will you'll never see again they're yeah. memorialized in cookbooks and memorialized in people's Instagram feeds. And that's it. So, you know, it's not like he wants that Rene Redzepi wants to just trot out the greatest hits and have those sort of like, uh, you know, valedictory lap. He just, you know, I think he wants to move on. And so the idea is like Noma will become this ethereal thing, mm. become like a movable feast, this constant pop up that might just appear in New York or appear in Mexico or appear in <clears throat> Albania. I don't know. I mean, you know, his family think, has roots in Albania. I think it's Anything a credit though. Yeah. I think it's a credit though to know when to stop. You know, the word quit is usually such a negative word to people, but it's really mm. not like when you put it in the context of quit while you're ahead. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. he's, um, he strikes me as somebody who, um, like you said, really enjoys the process and and having it succeed but as soon as he's done he's bored he's on to the next thing yeah. and um like i get that like i totally get that um some people thrive in the recreation and the ritual of doing the same thing on repeat year after year like cuz we're just all wired differently um but i i i kind of get it like i yeah. i I and and I got that actually too from reading the book, like how he would, you know, he had Noma and then he wanted to move Noma and then it yeah. was the pop up in Japan and the pop up in Mexico and it was it, it 
I got yeah. it like on a mental level, I got it because that's kind of how I am. Like as a creative, I'm always, you know, I've had a lot of different careers like that. I just jump from thing to thing because I'm constantly in a state of learning and, sure, and, yeah. and I'm not fired up unless I'm learning something new or challenged in some way. So like, I get it. Um, but I guess for people who had like their, the lifetime experience there, they want to be mm. able to come back year after year and have the same thing. And you can't. Oh yeah. You yeah. know, so it goes, I mean, I'll try to go back before it closes. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's a money thing. I've spent so much money going to Noma in Australia and Mexico and in Denmark. I mean, I always spent my own money. It wasn't the publications were not sending me. So uh, <laughs> hell to pay with my accountant. And, <laughs> well, um, we'll figure out how to make you money yeah. off of all your great ideas. I don't know. The, I mean, as you, the, the theme of this whole conversation is Jeff does not how to mo know how to monetize anything. Um, so I, I, um, yeah, I would like to go back. I, w I thought about going to the Japan one, but it's just, it's just a lot right now. The Japan one is happening right now. And it's just, it's really hard to just leave my family in the lurch and just, you know, go over there and just have a meal. So, um, that but. is hard. And, and it's interesting to me because your, um, your roots and, and the way you operated for so long was to travel and eat yeah. all over the world and experience. And now you've, you've compartmentalized that to be like at home. So you're experiencing it through poetry and, and Maybe, books yeah. and, and cooking on your own. So you, you've changed it. Um, I'm traveling it in, 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 in their in house, a different way. Yeah. yeah Mentally yeah. instead of physically. Exactly. I exactly. actually, this is, this is weird, Holly, but I found travel makes me very anxious these days. Mm. No, that makes no sense. Me. No, makes no. no sense. I mean, I've never been, I've, I've seemed friends of mine have said for years, you seem to be missing the fear DNA, like the, the fear chromosome, like I'm not particularly, I'm not somebody who gets afraid somewhere or uh, it, 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 but it's, and it's not like I'm going to die. That's not the fear. The fear is like the, the, the practical steps, the practical requirements of traveling. Oh, got to remember your passport. Got to remember to pack the right things. You know, how we go to the, they go to the airport, go on the plane. Now, I, I, for some reason, it's, it's in my, in my advancing age, it's become incredibly frustrating to me. And it didn't used to be, I used to find it thrilling, but lately, um, I did actually travel to Japan last year and, uh, it was the first time there. And it's obviously an extraordinary, uh, inspiring place to visit, just ex exquisitely beautiful. And, but I, I was, I was sort of undone by the, the uh, normal um, demands of travel, and I don't know what that is. If that, I'm just getting, I'm getting old and fussy. If the pandemic has made me more prone to, to fear, frankly, you know, I do know that. Like, I, I, I didn't, I was not friends with him, but like, I, I knew Tony Bourdain a little bit. You know, I, I, I met him, would cross paths with him, would talk with him, and. I got the, the impression that travel was really wearing him down in the end. Now, obviously, his, his travel demands were were exceptional. And, and right. there were all, all sorts of other issues going on, of course. And um, But, you know, people forget that, like, it takes its toll. Absolutely. Like, it takes its toll on your sleep cycle and your on your just mental stability. Like, you come back, you have fucking all these bills to pay, take out the recycling, clean the house. Like, it just it, – it, it's absolutely – inspiring and eye-opening and mind expanding to travel but it's also destabilizing right and, and so lately, lately i've found myself more anxious about the destabilizing aspects of it than i used to be and it's weird yeah but, weird, but, yeah but jeff like if you look at it um your need to travel was filling a void inside you whatever yeah, that was maybe, like maybe. you you needed to um, have your feet rooted in the earth, but in different places around the earth. And it, it fed you in a different way. And I'm not using like, you know, eating food. It, it fed your, your mind. It fed your creativity. It was the way you were built at that point in time. Yeah. And now that we've slowed down and you've had an opportunity, a forced opportunity 
to go inward and find things that are important to you in one space, you're, you're, you're experiencing that grounding and you're getting fed by standing still. Um, a lot of people have a hard time standing still, but you know, we got forced into doing it and I think it's feeding you. And, you know, it's funny, you wrote something in your book, um, about Renee and it sounds like it's about you too. You wrote, no one can be hungry forever. Mm. And I, I think, you know, now that, that speaks to who you are now, you know, you were, yeah, yeah, you were hungry before to travel and experience people and food and climate and culture and music and seasons in a different way. And now you're still doing that, but you're doing it in a more introspective manner and you're consuming books and poetry. Not that you didn't do that before, but you're using that as your form of travel now. And Could I think be. it's kind. Of, I think it's kind of beautiful, actually. Well, thanks. Where should I send the check? This has been a great, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> therapy session. I really, uh, I really, I, I appreciate it. I'm here for you, Jeff. I, I you know, and, and I'm also here. I'm going to be your your business strategy person one oh, day. Thanks. We're going we're going to spend some time one afternoon talking about all these beautiful things you create, and and maybe oh, cool. we can find a home for them because that's yeah, maybe you know that's the other piece of what I do. So awesome. you know, it's um. You just, uh, you know, I feel so bad. I like, I had like a list of things that I wanted to to share with everybody, but it, you know, I just love the direction that we went, and I yeah, oh um, yeah, it's all good. I think it's, um, you know, probably the one thing that I would say that, um, oh look, my sign's falling. Yeah, I know. It's funny. Off. Damn. Um, is uh, well, you see, my show's coming to an end. That's what. That is. <laughs> uh, um, my sweet potatoes beeping too. Oh, actually. there you go. All right, yeah. so. What, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to close it up then. I'm going to say that um, your attention to music is something that's really cool too. And Thank you. Um, I think that there used to be this term sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And um, I think food should be on there too, because your, yeah. your writing is so musical about food oh, and um, people, ha- you have to go get this book. I mean, I'm, I'm going to oh, read- thanks. I'm going to just read three lines okay. um, that you wrote that give people a sense of this book, because I don't want to leave this show without people understanding the quality of how you write. So you had put in there, um, our palettes quivered like tiny trampolines in anticipation. I mean, that's so beautiful. Here's another one. My eyelids lowered in quiet euphoria. And the last one I'll say is imagine ingesting flakes of night. Like you're, you're right. The last one is good. I like the other one seem a little, a little rich, but uh, no, yeah. it's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> well, you were talking about the, uh, the, I like mole. The, the mole. Yeah. That yeah. one, that one's pretty good. I, I, I do like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, for better or worse, you know, there's a lot of the poetry influence. I read so much poetry that I, it gets into my bloodstream, I think. And, for better or worse, it sometimes manifests itself itself in um, in a really nice turn of phrase. And sometimes I'm like, ooh, that was a little overwrought. But yeah, you know what? It's, it's I great. mean, somebody said to me, like, uh, the book was a little over the top. And I was like, what? I just, yeah, that's all right. I mean, we don't I like lo- that I, person. I, no, I mean, it's cool. I, I, I like over the top things, though. You know, like, I, I, I love Prince, you know, like, I love. Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. Like I like I like really over the top excessive kinds of ornate musical expression sometimes. So um it's fine with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, I th- I love what you do. Um Thank I you, love Molly. I love your writing whether I'm um perusing Instagram uh, and your stories or reading your books. I actually did just get your other book uh, that you wrote a long time ago. Um, and I'm X sorry. X saves the X, world. Yeah, yeah. X saves the world. Cause you know, us Gen Xers were here to, to do something. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm always reinventing myself. It sounds like you are too. So we'll, we'll yeah, figure it we out no together. Choice. All we're right. Fi- Holly. We're going to cool. figure it out. Yeah. Cool. This is great. Look forward and- to that. And I'm so, so honored that you came on the show. And um, I never asked you about coffee when your first sip oh, was, coffee. what you like to drink. You know, I have to at least part with that. Oh, 
I what didn't do drink, drink coffee until um, uh, my first job, uh, my first full time job at the Raleigh News and Observer, and, and the News and Observer Daily newspaper in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I, I, I had to bang out an enormous numbers of stories. It was like being a blogger decades later. I mean, like one day I wrote five articles. You know, I covered City Hall, I covered the city government. So, um, my friend Billy Warden. At one point, he was kind of Ferris Bueller type character, very excessive, extravagant personality. He was like, why don't you drink any coffee? <laughs> and I was like, I just, I don't know. And it just didn't really cross my mind. He's like, that's what, it, that's what it's for. And I remember I went down to some coffee house. I got myself a big, uh, a big coffee and bing, 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 bing. It was like, I was a, suddenly a pinball. Like I was just cranking out the writing and felt so energized, couldn't sleep. Um, and, uh, you know, it really worked. It worked on my system, like a, like an elixir. So, um, I, I, I'm like, like as with every, I said, I'm so boring now, but I'm really trying to cut back. Mm -hmm. I used to have pretty much unlimited amount of coffee till noon, unlimited. It didn't matter. To, I would just stop at noon so that I could sleep. Okay. But before that, you know, four giant things of cold brew, fine. Like David Lynch, just like espresso, 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 didn't matter. But I'm trying to reel that in because it's not good for my stress levels. Um, I often try to get some cold brew. I cold brew a lot of times these days because my kids are four and a half, four years old, like I said. And, you know, I don't have time to make some fancy pot of coffee. I don't got time. I mm -hmm. need it to hit my system immediately. I need Fair. to drink it, go under my tongue and start. Like I need to be caffeinated as quickly as possible. Um, uh, my friend Michelle down the street has a actually like a frozen yogurt place, but she she sells this cold brew made with chicory, like a New Orleans style yep. cold mm -hmm. brew. Oh my god, I love it! I will get my, actual my grandparents made that. Oh, cool! Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get I get like growlers. Actual people think I'm getting beer. I think that like I go there and I have these giant growlers, and they they think, oh wow, the writer. I mean, it's pathetic. He just drinks beer all day. It's not beer. It's coffee. Um, and I put those in my second fridge down in the basement and it gets me through. I yeah, think it's I awesome. My grandparents, you know, grew up during the depression yeah. and um, it was very common to mix chicory with coffee to stretch the life of oh, the right. coffee out because yeah. it's so expensive. Um, and as we know, in like New Orleans, um, it's uh, Cafe Du Monde, you know, the yeah. the chicory coffee is is still very, very popular. Um, and a lot of places are using it now. I go to Blue Bottle and they make one called Nola oh, um, wow. where they use it. And so I'm a fan as well. Yeah. And thanks for geeking out with me a little bit on the coffee too. Bet, I appreciate Holly. it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, well, off to my my rice bowl with my, my Japanese sweet potato. Good talking right. to you. Have a good you day. Too. Okay. Thanks. See you you too. Bye. Bye. Share your thoughts and ideas on coffee culture. You could put them in the reviews on Apple Podcasts or DM me on Instagram. And if you'd like to support an indie podcaster, there is a link in the show notes for buying me a coffee. Please subscribe and share a cup of coffee culture with your friends. This season is produced by Pale Blue Studios.